Three men floated in a black void. They should have been dead, but dark magic kept them alive. Their compatriots were not so fortunate. I'm sorry, a voice whispered to them. I have failed. Destruction looms on the horizon, but there is nothing I am capable of doing to stop it. My hopes and the hopes of every being who lives across these seas, they fall to you. I do not know how, but you must be victorious. Prometheus must not rise. Meanwhile, Iro made himself breakfast in his cabin on the ancient isle. He walked down to the beach. That's where he found the bodies. Arma Coldstone, Ripley Matarasi, and Pace, barely recognizable after being burned by Prometheus's flames. Iro walked over to the cleric. Armic's eyes snapped open. Not me, he muttered, the mark on his arm glowing. Heal them first. They're dead, Iro said solemnly, and I need your help to fix that. Cut to a dark beach. Ren and Sean crawled out of the ocean, injured but still alive. They looked up to see a fortress built on top of a mountain island. From some history checks, they learned that they were on the Devil's Throat, a dormant volcano the Rubicon Navy used as a prison. They walked up to the fortress and discovered it had been seized by Minerva Solanum, one of the other pirate lords. Solanum treated their wounds and explained she was there to create an army. She specialized in human transmutation, turning people into monsters, something they'd face firsthand when they fought Tolvin Thorell. She was in the process of transforming the island's inmates into monsters to unleash on Prometheus. Solanum explained that the Depths Queen wasn't dead just missing her physical form. She could be revived at full strength if the seven pirate lords were to bring their marks together. Unfortunately, with Orm having gone rogue and Crane's mark taken by Prometheus, this wasn't really an option. Ren asked about Ripley and Solanum pulled out a silver ring. She explained that the ring contained a piece of Ripley's soul, which could be used to break the seal on her mind and restore her memories. Solanum would give it to Ren if, and only if, he managed to defeat Prometheus. Ren agreed to her terms. Suddenly, alarms went off in the fortress's control room. Solanum panickedly explained that someone was down in the crater, where magic was used to keep the volcano dormant. Sean and Ren rushed to the edge of the volcano. They looked down and saw a sword sitting in the middle of hardened lava, a sword very similar to the ice blade Sean wielded. A man wearing red armor reached down, grabbed the sword, and pulled it free. The entire island shook as pillars of lava erupted from the crater. Sean and Ren ran back to the control room. Unfortunately, the earthquake broke open all of the prison cells, forcing the pair to fight through armies of angry chimeras and rooms filling with lava. When they finally made it back to Solanum, she was dead, stabbed in the heart. Her killer stood over her. He was a young prince in red armor. He looked sickly, with heavy bags under his eyes and an empty look on his face. Hey guys. How's it going? James said. What are you doing here? What? Oh, High Priest Fiery told me to take a detour on my way to Alcazar to deal with this mess. My father, uh, told me about how the Navy used one of the sealing swords to keep the island dormant, and I figured, well, why not just take the easy solution? Ren and Sean reached for their blades. James sighed. I'm disappointed. Not surprised, just disappointed. Guy Fiery told me about your work with the pirates. Told me that you were responsible for my mother's death. I had hoped he was lying. But he wasn't, was he? The Cult of Flames plans to destroy the world, and from its ashes, a new paradise will rise. I've done what you refused to. I've lit almost all of the remaining towers. And once the last two burn, a new dawn will shine on a beautiful world. The island shuddered as rubble fell between James and Ren and Sean. I don't want to hurt you, but I will if I am forced. Stay out of my way. James hurled a ball of fire at the duo. They dodged out of the way. When the smoke cleared, James was gone. Sean ran over to Solanum and pickpocketed the ring as the pair fled the fortress. They reached the shore, but they didn't have a boat to escape with. A loud roar rang out as a metal ship pulled up to the island, dragged by a dragon like a chariot. Buckland ship, the gold bloom. Iro stood on its deck, a triumphant captain, there to save his friends. Lady Umber and Pace, unburied by magic, threw ropes down to Ren and Sean. The ship sailed away before it was destroyed by the eruption. So, are you back? Ren asked. For now. But 
I want to make something clear. We do things my way. No more killing. No more evil. If we're going to save the world, we're going to do it without sacrificing our morals. Fine. I can live with that. We're heading for Alcazar. That's where all of this will go down. Hold on. There's something much more important that we need to discuss first. What are we going to call the new boat? We need a name that is as funny as the wretched wench. The Devil's Dirge. I suggest the horrible whore. We're calling it the Devil's Dirge. Meanwhile, on the other side of the island, James found his sailboat sank. Jaguar, one of the pirate lords, stood on top of the wreckage. She pointed her sword at him. You, prince, prepare to die. Nice sword. I have one just like it. I will take it from your corpse. James thought for a moment. Counteroffer. How would you like to get all of the sealing swords? The Devil's Dirge sailed to Alcazar Tower, a tower surrounded by floating mines and barbed wire, with a thick metal plate covering the opening. Using thaumaturgy, Armic asked nicely to be let in. An old man opened a tiny slot in the metal plate and shouted at the party, telling them to fuck off. Oh hey! It's that old guy! What's his face? Yes, it is I, General Ulysses Gale. An old man heavily entwined with the story of this world, who could explain big chunks of this world's backstory if you'd like. Especially about the storm sorcery stuff, and the history of the pirate lords, and the Rubicon Navy, and the sealing sword. Nah, we're good. This campaign has enough backstory as it is. Oh, okay. Do you know about Prometheus? Yes. If this tower gets lit, he rises and the world ends. We need you to let us in so we can safeguard the tower. Why on earth would I do that? Alcazar is sealed. No ship can get in. And, as long as I don't open the door, that statement will hold true. That's good, I guess. As long as a bunch of our enemies don't show up to murder us for revenge, we should be good. Right then, Machna Orm's boat rose out of the ocean. Hey guys, I'm here to murder you for revenge! At the same time, Jaguar's boat pulled up in front of the tower. Sword! She growled from the deck, dual wielding blades. The party fought against the two rogue pirate lords. Long story short, they won. Sean stabbed Jaguar in the gut, and she fell to her knees. This isn't fair. That's my sword. It's mine. 300 years ago, the sealing sword was shattered. Our family is taking care of one of the shards, the Blade of Boreas, for generations. It was my mother's sword, and it should have been mine. But no, she had to give it to Alice, my stupid little sister. I became a pirate lord so I could be strong enough to kill her. But by then... She had already hidden the sword with her stupid baby. The Depths Queen gave me the Blade of Notus, and the Prince gave me the Blade of Zephyrus for agreeing to distract you, but it's not the same. It's not my sword. Give me my sword! Sean leaned down and looked Jaguar in the eye. I don't really care, he said. Like, I'm sorry my grandma didn't love you or whatever, but that isn't really my fault. I loved my mom, but she died a long time ago, and I've made peace with that, so I don't really care enough to want revenge and shit. This is my sword. I call it Mother's Touch. It doesn't matter that it's ancient or magic. All that matters is that I use it to kill bad people and protect my friends. It's just a sword at the end of the day. Jaguar stared at him, fuming, as he turned around and walked away. Hey Pace, wanna kill a pirate lord for me? Pace flew down and shot Jaguar with a crossbow, killing her instantly. Meanwhile, Iro and Ren fought Orum. Gale saw the metal pirate and Misty stepped onto the deck of the warship to talk with him. It's been a long time, Mac. You've changed. I was so close. I could have made things right. One simple murder and the world would have been perfect. Arrow shook his head. No, you can't make the world good through being evil. You think it's just one little step over the line, but it isn't. It's a thousand little steps until you're so far gone you can't see where you started. We don't have to fight. You can lay down your guns, and we can end this. Right now. You know what? Fuck you, and fuck your naivete. Worm said as he drew his guns and fired at Iro. I'm sorry it has to be this way, old friend. Gale said as he blasted a bolt of lightning through Orum. Iro pointed his staff at Orum and cast heat metal. Orum screamed as the machinery inside his chest turned to liquid. He fell over, dead, as a mark appeared on Iro's arm. Gale walked over and put his cloak over the dead pirate. So, is it over? I don't think so, Pace said as she flew over to the others. Jaguar was just a distraction. She was sent by James to keep us focused on the wrong thing. What do you mean? Is the top of the tower guarded? Gale's eyes went wide. 
he yelled for his soldiers to open the gate. The metal plates swung open. In the distance, the party saw Prometheus and James standing in the center of the tower. Prometheus blasted open the fountain, and James walked down the stairs. The party rushed in. Prometheus laughed as he stood in their way, blocking the staircase. Really? You want to try this again? Sure, why not? Let's watch you burn! He threw a fireball, severely injuring the party. Armok raised his holy symbol and healed them. Prometheus scowled and tossed two more blasts of flame. Again, Armok healed his friends. Prometheus gritted his teeth, flew in close, and focused all of his firepower on Armok. Armok fell over, barely breathing. What's wrong, little man? Daddy Astitia not here to rescue you? Armok swung his hammer, smacking Prometheus in the face and knocking him back. He rose from the ground, eyes glowing, as divine intervention gave him the strength he needed. He raised his hammer over his head as colossal waves poured in from the outside. Twenty-foot-tall swells of water surrounded Armik and Prometheus, orbiting around them like a belt of asteroids. And then, Armik Coldstone said something in a booming voice that was not entirely his own. Eight perfect words. You, you do not, not belong, belong in this world anymore. He swung his hammer and the waves crashed together, crushing Prometheus. Prometheus tried to fight back the waves with his fire, but Armik pointed his finger at him. A flash of light exploded from within Prometheus. When the waves washed away, Prometheus was gone. In his place sat a red smear and a cleric with unwavering faith. Did we win? No. I destroyed the vessel, but Prometheus' spirit still lives. But this is good. I was able to reach out to my god. They're coming back. If we can hold out for a few more days, we don't have to worry about stopping Prometheus. A few days is still enough time to light the last two towers. The party went down to the dungeon. It was solved and the brazier was lit. James was gone, off to light the final tower. The party discussed their options with Gale. James wasn't as strong as Prometheus possessed Fiery, meaning he couldn't just blow open the fountain and prosper to get to the dungeon. He need to find the medallion, meaning they had time. Not much time, but enough to breathe. Ren pointed out that James was acting weird when he saw him at the volcano. He was cruel and seemed to enjoy killing. Ren speculated that, maybe, Prometheus was able to control James because of all the blood he'd given to light the braziers. The party pointed out that Ren had also given blood to the braziers, albeit far less than James, meaning that, in theory, Prometheus could try to control him too. The blood was a problem, if only there was a way to get that blood back. The party came up with a very, very dangerous idea. The braziers were portals to Prometheus' cage where he had been sealed away centuries ago. And if they were portals, then why couldn't the party just walk through them? They made their preparations. They had Dr. Doofensmertz make them protective armor, a Gale, Iro, and Armic cast every protection spell they could think of, and prepared to march into fire. Armic Coldstone, Sean Stryker, and Iro stepped into one of the braziers and disappeared, transported into a world of flames.